and thank you so much for tuning in to watch the second in our series of neurodivergent athlete video blogs. So today we are joined by Sarah Hope. She is an ex-women's wheelchair basketball player and also a current para ice hockey player. She has autism as well and she joins us today to talk about her experience of being an athlete and being neurodivergent. We're particularly excited about interviewing Sarah because she is just such an incredible person and a really great advocate for people with neurodivergence, people with disabilities and just about everyone in between. So without further ado, over to Sarah to talk to you about her conditions and her experiences. So I have a condition called hereditary peripheral neuropathy. Yeah. It's not very exciting. Um, it was an inherited condition, affects the nerves in my lower legs. Um, so they've just kind of died off to an extent, um, which kind of makes it very difficult to stand and walk and any of that type of stuff. Um, to start with, my biggest problem wasn't, okay, I can't run anymore. Yeah, I was devastated that I couldn't run. But the fact that I didn't know mm. why I couldn't run, that that got me more than the physical problems. Yes. Um, I needed an answer. I needed to be able to put it in a box. I didn't know whether I was able-bodied or disabled. Um, I just, I couldn't settle. I needed an answer. Um and I didn't get one for a number of years. It took a few years to be diagnosed. Um, and in the meantime, I didn't really know sort of what I was doing with myself. And I think that change for me was probably harder than, oh, I can't really walk. I mean, for me, walking is getting from A to B. I didn't have a great fondness for walking places. You know? <laughs> I like to run. Running was what I missed. Walking is irrelevant. I don't mind how I get around, whether it's on crutches, whether it's in a wheelchair. Yeah, that's kind of yeah not really important to me um but yeah not knowing what it was how I was supposed to carry on living my life um I found difficult mm. um uh, I ended up at a pain clinic in Birmingham and I actually got told by the psychologist there that I had adapted too well <laughs> Is there such a thing? And I'm just like, well, you know, I've, I've got a job. I've got things to do. Do you expect me to just spend the last few years sitting at home doing nothing? Like, yes, I've adapted. I've There's a problem. I need to get out. And here I, you know, so things like having my car adapted for hand controls, um, getting a wheelchair. I just, I just did these things because... Yeah, yeah. And and to be honest, sport helped with that because um, I then started playing wheelchair basketball and suddenly I'm surrounded by other people with physical challenges that just get on with life, that mm. just, you know, they're not sitting at home complaining about it. They're, they've got jobs and relationships and they play sport and they're just getting on with their lives. And I'm like, well, okay, well, if they can do it, I can do it. So I did. And then, yeah, got told I was adapting too well. <laughs> um, but I think that is, yeah, that is a positive aspect of autism is that sometimes in when you're in a high stress situation, you just don't get emotional about it and you just find a way to, to crack on. And then I got into a sports chair for the first time and you're just flying up and down the court. Um, and it was just so freeing from, you know, have many months of not being able to do anything. And and I've missed the exercise, definitely. I think when you're used to working out a lot and it's part of your daily routine and then suddenly you can't, it's definitely something you miss. Um, basketball became a bit of a semi-special interest for a bit. So I kind of threw myself into it and yeah, I had the ability to catch and throw the ball and move the chair around um, in a basic level. Um, but then it was pretty much just hard work, I think, that got me to to where I got. Um, obviously, there was a certain amount of potential there, um, you know, the coaches saw and helped me sort of explore. Um, 
but yeah I'm definitely not as naturally talented as an awful lot of the other girls from the GB team um and I definitely have to put in more hours mm. <laughs> to uh to be able to try and keep up with them um but again I think that's that's one of the advantages to my autism is just that ability to train and train and train and train and do the same thing over and over and over again until you get it right mm. um and you know for an opportunity to represent my country I was willing to put the work in I think mm. if I wasn't autistic and I didn't have that willingness to do it I didn't have that drive to do it I don't know whether I would have got to the level that I'm at um but also my love of routines my love of a schedule um have we spoke about this <laughs> I do love a schedule <laughs> um you know I'll um have a plan for the week a training plan for the week um and you know there might be some athletes that get to the end of the week and they're like oh, I'm tired or really don't fancy doing this today and I will definitely feel the same way I'm tired I don't feel like doing it but because it's on my schedule I have to do it I will stick to my training schedule um even if it means getting up at ridiculous times in the morning or staying up late at night um because for me, it would be more upsetting, I suppose, if I didn't do it. I wouldn't mm. be able to settle because I'd be out of my routine. Um, so even though, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a slog. I'm going to have to push myself. Um, I definitely have to do this workout. Mm. Uh, and that was, you know, hugely beneficial for me during lockdown, um, where I think a lot of people may be lost a little bit of enthusiasm having to train on their own especially when you're in a team sport and you have to train on your own for months and months and months on end um for me I had a whiteboard with a schedule and I stuck to it <laughs> it was invited to my first GB senior camp um in 2013 at the time it was a decentralized program so it was just training camps um like every couple of months um, I really struggled with those because we didn't receive a whole lot of information about mm. what was going to happen, what the schedule was like. Um, you know, I, I didn't really know these girls that I was training with. So I definitely didn't perform at my best. Um, but at that time, I didn't really know what I needed in order to perform at my best. And I think there is that added pressure on neurodivergent athletes to understand themselves to an extent that neurotypical athletes don't need to mm. in order to get the most out of themselves in order to ask for adjustments or or know where their strengths lie mm. the gb went centralized the year after in 2014 i believe um and I started training with them full time. Uh, sorry, every morning in 2014, I would train for two hours before I went to work. So I'd be up at half five, train sort of seven till nine and then go to work 10 till six. And I knew that was going to be a lot for me, especially with training in the evenings as well. Um, and I struggled to keep up and I sort of was saying to the coaches, you know, I'm struggling to to do all of this it's an exhausting day I'm getting home at like eight nine in the evening eating sleeping getting up at half five the next day like I was told well this is the reality of elite sport um you know you're either in or you're out <laughs> um and yeah I burnt out pretty quick <laughs> um yeah I had to I had to quit GB because I couldn't leave work because I needed to pay the bills um so I had to leave GB basketball I was just like well obviously then I don't have what it takes which is you know it was pretty devastating <laughs> um you know having sort of lost running having found basketball and thinking yeah yeah this is this is going to be great and then being told actually no you can't progress because even though you might have the skill um you don't have the mindset um so I sort of had to go away and sort of figure things out myself to an extent and um 
and for me at the time even though I knew I was autistic like uh, self-diagnosed um because I struggled to get a diagnosis on the NHS um I, yeah, yeah. I think I've heard a lot of stories about this um I decided it would probably be in my best interests if I went and got an official diagnosis mm. because then it would be okay I, I felt a little bit more backed up to be able to say okay here yeah. is my bit of paper I understand, I understand that here are the sure. things that I need it, it just yeah um so that's when I went away and, and got my diagnosis and um and after a year off I asked if I would go back to GB um they said yes you'll have to start again at the beginning you have to you know try out and go to camps and so you know in reality I, I my career was set back three years because I didn't know what support I needed mm. despite speaking to the coaches, the performance lifestyle advisor and the sports psychologist. <laughs> and, um, and and actually having told the performance lifestyle advisor, I'm a sports psychologist, I was autistic. And they, I, th I don't think they knew what that meant. Yeah. And, and the onus is on the athlete to to know what you need yeah um, I feel it, like ooh. no I was just I was just gonna say it's I wasn't even asked or oh, what do you need yes yeah it was like oh okay yeah I know 100% get get it sorry talking over you there really sorry. trying not to do that um, <laughs> <laughs> as I've said doing other, I'm doing a good job at other interviews I, I've done I look back at it and I'm like oh my god I've literally just spoken over someone like over and over again which is a bit of an autistic trait but um <laughs> can't read the room yeah. um but it just be I, I was like driven to say something just because mm -hmm. it, it really really kind of resonated with me. Like, everything you're saying is resonating with me but especially that I think for me and and a lot of the autistic athletes or athletes with autism who I have spoken to have talked about almost like you're already having to carry this whole system on your back. I like mm -hmm. I kind of think in pictures, so like, you know, you're already having to do all this work behind the scenes and do the translating and everything. Uh, and then and then you're having to do that and then some more and then advocate and then and it's like there's only so much energy that a person has mm -hmm. um and there's like a lot that's unseen that yet yeah, people people don't see that's going and I, I just I guess when you see it as as a as a sort of as, a, as an image you, you've got all that weight extra weight on your back. and as an athlete you're trying to get those extra one percents and you know coaches are kind of advising athletes like you know eat eat like a hundred grams more protein here or yeah. you know do this 10 minutes earlier or get 10 minutes more sleep you're talking about all these one percenters but you've got this massive unseen load on a group of athletes that if you could do something to alleviate that it would have an incredibly huge impact and i think that's the problem with um things that are you can't see mm -hmm. and especially yeah. when the athletes themselves part of the problem is they can't advocate they can't talk about it um so it doesn't get across mm -hmm. it's like a doubly hard thing like people just they don't quite understand the impact and the weight of of these issues and then they don't know how to help and then and they don't help and then it's like you're put in very un unreasonable situations that people don't see Um, and I was just wondering, because we did speak about this, but as somebody who has a physical disability that people can see, and then mm -hmm. somebody who also has a neurodivergence that people can't see, um, and like people see you're, you're, you're in a wheelchair and, and they understand what that means and the difficulty that that must pose. And I just wonder from your perspective, that must give you a lot of power to to explain you know 
how much impact each of them has and perhaps to like try and explain how much neurodivergence and the difficulties that come, come with that can impact a person. And I was wondering if you just you want to speak about that because we did briefly speak about that together. Yeah, yeah, we did. Um, yeah, I think it is interesting and certainly, you know, just having other people's reactions to you with both sort of a an invisible disability and a very visible one. Mm. Um, you know, I still get <laughs> people coming up to me as a wheelchair user and they'll speak like slower and louder. <laughs> you know, <laughs> disability is not with my ears. It's okay. <laughs> um, or, you know, we've had it where if I'm with an able-bodied friend, they'll talk to the friend and not to me. Um, you know, famous incident in an airport. Can I have her passport? She's no. Walking. Yeah. No. Um, you know, uh, and things like that. And you kind of, because people are just like, okay, I'm going to assume that because she can't walk, she can't do anything. Um, but then at the same time, once people do see that oh, I can talk and I can move around and I'm fairly independent, then there's almost a less, they're less inclined to believe that there are other struggles behind in mm -hmm. terms of masking, communication, um, you know, any any of the other things that I might struggle with. Um, but they're like, but you but you can talk so well and you're an intelligent person and you look like you've got your life together. Thanks very much. Um, <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> but then it's almost harder to convince them that <clears throat> actually, no, it takes me twice as long to do all of this stuff. Um, so, yeah, people will almost sort of overplay the impact of the physical disability and underplay the impact of the neurodivergence. And, and yeah, and I think we talked about um, a talk I gave at a mm. company a little while ago um, about disability in the workplace and adaptations needed. And, you know, the places I've worked, especially within sport, because I've always been within para sport, having a physical disability is just normal. Mm. Um, you know, most buildings nowadays that I work in going to have an accessible entrance somewhere um and especially within basketball and, and ice hockey everyone's disabled mm. you know if you're able-bodied then you're the, minor the minority <laughs> um so everything is kitted up for us being a wheelchair user is just normal it's it's not a thing whereas being autistic is the minority and that's the thing that's going to cause it's going to have a bigger impact on my day to day than not being able to go up steps. I retired from international basketball in March, uh, even though I'm still playing international ice hockey. Um, I've obviously not, not funded anymore. So I've gone back to work and, uh, you know, there are two entrances to the office. One is flat and one is up steps. And uh, and they apologise. Oh, we're so sorry that, you know, you can't get into this entrance. And I'm like, that's irrelevant. What can we do about the fluorescent lighting and the ticking clock? Yeah. <laughs> you know, how I get in the office, uh, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> we want to talk about these things. <laughs> Let's talk about not changing my schedule at the last minute. Let's talk about clear and concise instructions. Let's talk about my autonomy. Um, and what's the reaction you get? Because obviously, like you're saying, they're kind of very apologetic about the physical. It's like that's almost accepted. It's like um, much more inclined to empathise with that. And then I'm, I'm wondering what reaction you get to, you know, wanting. Um, um, you know, my my new boss is brilliant. I can't falter. Um, and they're very happy to listen and and take that on board. And I think that has come from having to understand myself in order to progress in sport because like I said that that onus is on the athlete to understand their neurodivergence and understand how they can get the best out of themselves because 
there isn't that support network in place within sport to be able to help athletes figure that out themselves. Um, so I had to go away and learn about myself. I had to go and figure out, okay, what sets me off in a meltdown? How can I work longer? How can I work out longer? How much sleep, how much downtime do I need? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Work out all these things myself. Um, and and basketball was almost that process. Going through basketball was figuring out myself. So by the time I started ice hockey and by the time I started work, I already had a blueprint for how do I get the most out of myself as an athlete or as an employee. <clears throat> so I could go to my boss and I can say. Right, yeah, I can get into the building through that entrance. I don't care about that entrance. Let's talk about how to make me a better employee once I'm in the office. So here are the five things that we can do to get the most out of me. And I think, firstly, there's a bit of shock mm. from a, you know, a manager just going, oh, I've, here I've got an employee who knows exactly what they need and and how to how to be a more efficient worker um i don't think they're necessarily used to that um but you know the the one thing that i've learned about being an athlete is that we know how to get the most out, out of ourselves mm. we know how to do whatever it takes to get to the top because that's what athletes do right ice hockey and and my new job have been very receptive to the fact that they're being handed a plan about mm. how to get the most out of me and coaches and bosses surely that's what they want <laughs> yes yes and I hope <laughs> you know you'd hope you've over a long period of time like grown to understand yourself and that's sport has helped you to do that but should it be that it takes each individual neurodivergent athlete eight to ten years to understand how they work and by that time they're past their prime yeah. and they're tired and they're ready to move on and like is that fair and and not just is that fair but are we exposing a lot of neurodivergent younger neurodivergent athletes to to potential trauma and and neglect and a uh, career of feeling ashamed and unable to speak for themselves until they get out the other side and that's kind of what led me initially to to disclose it on my Instagram was just you know I haven't got that many followers but a lot of them were from wheelchair basketball and I'm just like okay well taking that that first step of okay let's let's admit that um you know this is me and uh and see what happens and then I think it was Alice at first came up to me at a, at a tournament and thanked me for being honest about it on Instagram because you know that that's basically the position that she was in and she wanted to know that it was possible to play GB when you're autistic and yeah over the years other people have have said things and and in the end yeah we We've got a WhatsApp group now. Um called because the collective. I've just, Collect I've coll the collective. I've collected, um, <laughs> just because I've collected these girls over the years and I was just like, yeah, this is my collection. Um and you know, it's open to anyone within wheelchair basketball that's ND and uh, it's not official, it's just word of mouth. Um, you know, and it it's it's varied conversation and it's a safe space and not everyone is, you know out in terms of their diagnosis but um you know it's it's just a good place to chat and I'm just like if I'd had that mm. when I was going up through through the ranks in wheelchair basketball it might have made <coughs> life a little bit easier <laughs> I yeah I 100 percent 100 percent get that you know in the meantime you know I'll I'll keep talking to people like you doing a great job in terms of you know advocating for change within sport and I'll keep posting on my Instagram um in the hope that people can message me or 
or do whatever you know I do a QA and a every year yeah. on my Instagram on Autism Awareness Day 2nd of April um, where people can just ask questions if they don't want to you know message me randomly during the year um, and you know my next task this this year is going to be attempting to make Women's Premier League more accessible for autistic spectators it's making little changes and then hoping that someone else pick up the mantle once we've stopped and then start making a few more changes and then mm. little by little it's been absolutely fantastic to talk to you and hopefully we both have a successful 2023 and you know make a positive impact to a lot more of the virgin athletes in the future Let's hope. Yeah, it's been great. I love what you're doing. Thank you so much for having Thank me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Right. Bye.